Welcome to the Evolving Warfighter. My name is Dr. Franklin Annis, and today I'm joined by uh, a veteran and a horseman, uh, Jock Hutchison from uh, the UK. He has an interesting program where he's uh, kind of using horses uh, to get back to nature, and he has this intersection with uh, Stoic philosophy uh, that he's doing great things for uh, himself and other veterans out there. So thank you for joining me today, sir. It's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure to join you today. Thank you, Frank. So I was hoping that you could take a, a moment just to kind of tell us more about your background and what Horseback UK is. Yeah, sure. I served in the Royal Marines from 1986 to 1996. Uh, for me, it was, um, it, it, I didn't expect it to be so, but I found a family that I felt very comfortable with. And I loved the attitude, which was very much can do. We, we, we weren't very keen on impossible. And, you know, what it taught me is that if you if you believe that you can do something, you can do it. And to attain that belief is repetition. And that, you know, we went through a process that was regarded as one of the toughest military training programs in the world. But it brought us together and taught me more about myself than anything else I've ever done. And then I was privileged enough to, to be a troop commander. And I, I, I really, <coughs> for me, leadership was about responsibility making sure everybody in my troop was able to do the best job they could because they'd been properly briefed, prepared, trained, etc. And, um, you know, I learned a great deal about that. I trained uh, uh, Royal Marines for a couple of years. I then became a military pilot. And again, I experienced teamwork in very intense situations where you've got to be sharp communication wise because there's three of us flying the, the Sea Kings. And it, operationally, you know, we're, it's at night, MVG goggles. So you really have to be a tight team. And, you know, the, the joy of being in a good team for me is, is one of the highlights of my life. You know, when you hit the team, well, a good team and they've got a real job in front of them, I don't think there's any greater pleasure. So after my career, I set up a business that uh, with security and for 10 years I did that. And I discovered something. That you could be miserable in silk sheets just as quick as you can in cheap ones. <laughs> Well, one of the funny things that happened was the more successful the business became, the more it consumed me. And I had, all, to be honest with you, I'd always set the business up because I had the dream of having a farm and horses. And um, after 10 years in 2007, there was an economic downturn. And I uh, had a wonderful mentor called Julian Thompson, who headed the Falklands War for the, um, the land forces in the UK. And he told me that Alexander the Great had said, it takes a good general... <coughs> to know when to retreat, but it takes a truly great one to do it. And the truth is that we were in a situation where if a kindergarten, the cash flow would have drained us, you know, dry because the work was intermittent uh, and uh, had to make the decision to, to, to fold the business. And I found that very difficult. But the relief I got once I'd done it because it was the right decision was enormous. And what it did was it freed me up to do what I'd always wanted to do. And okay, I couldn't buy the farm, I couldn't buy the horses, but we found a place to rent and we converted it and we got some horses and everything was going great. And at that time, uh, um, this was back in <clears throat> so 12 years ago, I visited 4-5 Commando, which is one of the units I'd served in uh, whilst I'd been in the Royal Marines. And I met 16 young men that had come back from Afghanistan with life-changing injuries and they had lower leg injuries most of them. So they were either double amps or, or, or single amps because the IED was a weapon of choice at that time. And um, the, the medical care these guys had got was unbelievable um, because they would never have survived if it happened 10 years previous. And the, the Corps had done a wonderful job of getting these guys back to the point where they could, you know, they could live again. But the trouble is they couldn't do the jobs that they had been trained to do. And what was happening is that they were having to leave the family that had given them not only a job but an identity and try to reestablish themselves in Sibby Street. Now, I, I tried to reestablish myself in Sibby Street. And, and for instance, I went away and spent about £25,000 um, becoming a commercial pilot, <laughs> which I did for about a week before I realised that it was not for me. So it, it can be very difficult transitioning away from the family of the military. And if you're carrying an injury, and you've got to sort of reestablish yourself. So the way I put it was, there's not much point in fixing these guys unless you give them a future. And we decided that we were going to create a charity that was going to help individuals post-clinical care, introduce them to the outdoor civilian world and jobs within it, 
but also bring them together because the main uh, problem that I saw these guys facing was isolation. So the, the separation from the family unit, as it were, the core, and that loss of identity, and then going home to a flat or you know somewhere and having to watch daytime TV, that is not acceptable. That is not going to do you any good if you're 100% healthy. So we set the charity up because of that. We wanted to do the three main pillars that we built on were community, because that's what had been stolen from these guys, purpose. And one of the interesting things that we found about the guys is that you know, they okay, they'd been hurt bad and some of them are physically disabled. I wouldn't call it disabled because compared to most civilians I see, you know, they're not disabled, <laughs> but they'd lost a limb or something. But what they wanted most of all is to do something. And what they wanted most to do was to help others who were in a similar position to they were, but further back in the journey. And we, so the three words, community, purpose, and power were the bedrock upon which we built the charity. There's a lot of great things in there. So years ago, I used to work for the Nebraska Department of Labor, uh, helping homeless veterans or unemployed veterans. But it's quite amazing when you take, you know, you get a severely injured veteran that walks out and we think, well, if we have compensation, we give them whatever money every month to live on, they can go about their lives. But it's amazing a number of them can get trapped in little tiny apartments doing nothing and they become more and more isolated, and that almost leads to suicide, where, you know, you encounter those folks even if they're 100% disabled by at least the U.S. standards. We used to tell them, that like, you need to find a job or you need to find a charity because if you can't reconnect in your community, like, you're, you're just going to waste away. It's, it's not a matter of money or resources. It's a, you don't have that human connection, you're just going to fall apart. Well, if the best thing you can be is part of a, a good team that's got a purpose, the worst thing you can be, in my opinion, is alone without purpose. So, you know, it's that simple. And, and the other thing is I think society should and needs to consider more about how they utilise the experience that people have had on recovery to benefit others who need to take that recovery. So can you talk about how your program initially got started? Like what gave you that idea and then kind of maybe how your program may have evolved? Well, I mean, you know, as I explained to you, um, most of the people that we hosted here at the beginning 12 years ago were people who had experienced um, a loss of limb, lower limb. And I've always been into, I was schooled in North Carolina and uh, I've been horse crazy since I was a little boy. I mean, horse nuts. But I really didn't ever enjoy jodhpurs or the English way of riding horses, if I'm being perfectly honest. My hero was a guy called Ben Johnson. When I was a little boy, I used to watch uh, Ben Johnson was in every single movie you've seen John Wayne in. And he was the horseman. So he's in the searchers. He's in all, they, you know, I was looking at the guys on the horses going, wow, that is how I want to ride a horse. And so when I got to North Carolina at 17, I met some people who worked with working horses. And the whole relationship they had was very different to the one I saw the relationship with horses over here. It was more like sheepdog and shepherd than rider and horse. Because if you're cutting cows or roping, you, you know, you really have to have, uh, it needs to be teamwork, total teamwork. And, you know, if the horse isn't 100% with you, you're not going to be with the horse 100%, which is going to hurt. So um, I was uh, fascinated by all that. And so when we moved to the farm after the business, I wanted to cross thoroughbreds and coral horses. And I had a guy, blah, 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 and it looked highly probable. And it was then that I met the 16. And the, the reason I invited them up was A, because I saw the need, but B, somebody said, you know, the farm would be a great place to get the guys out of the camp. Got the guys to the camp and then began to think, well, these little horses, the way we ride them, you don't really need two arms and two legs. They're very manoeuvrable. You neck rein rather than hold on to two reins. And we called it mobility with dignity. So what I saw was the ability, what I said to people was the thing that would upset me most about losing my legs is not being able to get the hell away from the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of giving somebody this mobility, the freedom to go and wander the hills was at the heart. But we learned very quickly that whilst that was potent, it was actually the relationship and building the relationship between the individual and the horse that had the profound effect. Because most of the guys that came here had never been near a horse. And of course, you know, a horse weighs three quarters of a ton is a big hairy son of a gun. And, uh, you know, if you don't understand them, they can be a bit intimidating. So the first thing the individual, they had to overcome that kind of nervousness to interact. And then they had to uh, work out how to connect with the horse. 
Now, this is where our friends the Stoics come in. There's a man called Xenophon who is recognised as being the first two horsemen. And he thought he said it was much better to make a horse than break it. And it was about kindness and patience in creating the relationship. So we, I didn't know this at the time, I have to say. So, but we developed courses that were about how the horse and, and the individual could interact, allowing the human being to become the leader, but a good leader, an empathetic leader who understood the horse and understood that each horse was different and it needed different amounts of energy. And this is where we ended up. That the power of creating that relationship. I mean, if you consider isolation being one of the issues with, so this connection that was formed between the horse and the individual was massively powerful. And the fact that the human had to be a leader, the benign uh, leader, meant that they had to look at themselves. And this is the essence of all leadership, as far as I'm concerned. You know, above Delphi in Greece, there are only two things that are written. And the first is know thyself. And if you're working a horse, it's, you're going to have to adapt to the horse, not insist the horse adapts you, because the horse is by nature a nervous critter. You know, if you add pressure to him, he's going to get stressed. Nobody learns anything stressed. So the secret of horsemanship is to get the horse's head right and trust you and be able to focus on you. And in doing so, you learn a great deal about yourself. And, you know, what we wanted to provide our attendees was the mental belief that they were leaders again in their own worlds, could steer their own ship. And the process was about confidence and rebuilding it, but also about connecting to 10 other people who were in a similar place and giving them a sense of community through that. And then from each group, we encouraged everybody to become either ambassadors or mentors. The mentors would attend the next course or a course down the line and act as mentors. And it's all residential, so the guys and girls eat together and, um, you know, socialise together, not, not, not alcohol, no drugs, but, you know, it, it's about bringing people together. So, you know, we've been doing that for 10 years. Five years ago, we started doing programmes for kids. And again, confidence and about trying to help kids that were excluded from the educational process or self-excluded, but give them the confidence to re-engage with it. And since then, so we've we've helped over two and a half thousand people over the last decade. The great thing about the kids is we use military mentors to teach. So we've got this bridge, creating purpose for the for the military community and really having a profoundly positive effect on the kids because many of the kids that come here, and I've got to try a word this politely, but when they walk through the gate, you know, say, well, I've got OCD, PCD, and I just look at them and go, kid, thank God I wasn't born when you were, because I'd have more labels than a Tesco superstore mate. You know, I'm glad you don't have any goddamn, you know, you've got the labels. Let's see how we use these things and this energy that you have rather than be fearful of them. Because I think in society now, you know, we're very quick to label and then pop pills at people. Well, that, you know, that that, that might mask the symptoms for a while, but it doesn't cure anything. The only way you're going to help people mentally is to get them to know themselves and start to work towards a destination with other people. Yeah, there's a lot of, to be said about, like, whether it's whatever attention deficit disorder or whatnot, there's there's actually a lot of professions that need that type of behavior. So inside a classroom, it's incredibly <coughs> disruptive, but like a police, a firefighter, or a soldier is actually more adaptive if they have those traits. So I think oh, over- I couldn't agree more. What we, we're doing the wrong thing in society. Yeah. What we're doing is labeling people way too early and saying, okay, you, look, the truth is what I tell people is if I line a Shetland pony up next to a cob, next to a, a quarter horse next to a thoroughbred. They're obviously different. My job as a leader is to work out who does what best and then put them there. I am not a good leader if I ask the Shetland pony to run in the derby. <laughs> and the truth is teams need different skills. So what we don't want is everybody to be in a narrow skill band and we will achieve nothing. What we need is a range and we need to um, uh, you know, understand that these energies that people have you can either look them, as you say, negatively, or you can use them. You're not going to make a very good marine unless you've got, a, you know, a set, some sort of energy running through you. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel quite strongly about this at the moment because I think if you label people, you are what you believe you are. And, you know, young people are very malleable. So if you start to tell somebody that they've got X, Y, or Z, you know, you're almost shaping them. 
I'm not sure what it's like over in the UK, but I know in the United States, we've kind of really narrowed our approach to education. So either you fit in the mold or you don't, where traditionally we used to have a lot more apprenticeships and other ways that like, well, you just even go past back like 70 years in time, you really didn't need a high school diploma to go out and be highly successful. But now it's, you don't get your college degree. Everyone thinks that they're, they're not going to be, be successful. So it's, it's really opening up that model and well, like you said, kind of learning what you do best and offering kind of more options to life due to the uniqueness of the individual. Absolutely. And these, and, the, and these different intelligences make humanity. In previous conversations I had with you, you, you talked about how you were running the program for about a decade, and then you really discovered the overlap between the formal Stoic philosophy um, and what you were trying to do or what had naturally been the successful ideas coming back from the wounded veterans. I was wondering if you could talk about that more. And... Well, I hope there's a sort of, you know, I believe that the reason we, we, uh, we discovered Stoicism, if you want to put it that way, is there's a fundamental truth to uh, both Stoicism and how you work a horse. And, you know, the, these truths come up again and again and again. And maybe they're articulated slightly different. But to me, the first thing was Amore Fati. When I read that, you know, you consider the people that come here, they've lost legs or they've lost limbs, they've lost something. Well, you've got a choice, man. You sit and complain that the gods are unkind and curse them. Or you say, what can I do with what I've got? How can there be a choice? <laughs> you know, option one is pants. It is not going to make you happy or anybody else happy. So it's not an option. So the really only thing you can do is to make the best of what you have. Now, I work with a guy called Jay here. I mentioned to you, he got his right leg blown off, his face blown off, he lost his right eye, digits off the right hand. And th this is why I'm so passionate about what I do. I, none of the people that I've served here have ever complained about what happened to them. They never cursed the military or, the, or even the, you know, the enemy. They understood that if they were to be happy, they were going to have to just accept what had happened to them and try to find a new source to direct their energy. And um, Jay is our lead. Um, he's head of Ops, we call it, which is sort of pompous. But basically, he designs and runs the courses for the kids, especially. And to watch this guy with one leg and the, the, the effect he has on people, because you can't really sit at Jay and go, oh, no, I don't want to go outside because, you know, I've got a sore toenail. Really? <laughs> 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 so, and, and the fact is, I think also, if I'm being brutally honest, there's a sort of ruggedness and directness in the way he communicates with young people and honesty that perhaps uh, teachers would be a little afraid of doing. And, you know, maybe some of the, I think a lot of the kids that come here are, you know, maybe just outside the norm a little bit, not miles out, but just, you know, we're all different. And to me, it's about getting these kids to believe that they can use that difference rather than be frightened of it. So to me, Amori Fati, when I discovered this, and it was only maybe 18 months ago, two years ago, that I began to read up. Uh, and I can't remember what drew me to it. It must have been Xenophon. You know, I was interested in the works of Xenophon. And then Xenophon was lit to Seneca, Marcus Aurelius. So he began to read this, these guys. And I just found the truth to me, my truth. I, I, everything they said, I thought, wow, that is, that's, that's, verbalizing something that I've kind of known and seen and you know they're so articulate and the fact is that they existed you know a long time ago um it shows me that our wisdom as human beings is not shifted in the slightest you know we've changed tools and stuff but the condition of being a human hasn't changed at all we're still frightened of death we're still frightened of you know we and, and the trouble is with modern society to me is we don't look at that which we're frightened of anymore we try to avoid it. You know, over here we have non-competitive sports. I don't understand that at all, you know, because we don't want to have kids that lose. The only valuable lesson you're going to get at school is how to lose. How to win. Any fool can win. <laughs> That's easy. Learn how to lose. And then you'll be able to take life on because you won't be frightened of it. And to me, the, the words that our stoic friends emit are succinct little pockets of wisdom that align perfectly to what I have seen in a decade of working here. Yeah, I really regret, at least on this side of the pond with the 
in the American military that we lost our connection with the Xenophon. So even myself, like I, I hadn't, well, I may have heard about him years ago, but I, I only started reading Xenophon maybe 18 months ago and go, going through some of his work is just absolutely amazing. Um, I absolutely love his work, the Anabasis, and uh, all, they have no cavalry, you know, just a, a group of Greek mercenaries trying to get out of this country before they're destroyed. And you talk about motivational speeches because anyone in the military understands, you know, maneuverability. If you only have infantry and your enemy is skilled archers and cavalrymen, you're like, you're dead. But here he is, Xenophon can take that and say, you know, flips it on the coin and says, you know, infantrymen can strike harder than any cavalryman can because if you're on a horse, you can't hit hard because you're worried about falling off You can hit once. You know, that's the thing with cavalry. You know, I, I read about Alexander the Great, who, you know, he, before I found uh, uh, um, Stoicism, and I, just in, you know, in awe of the guy. But one of the reasons I was in awe of him was because he had a horse called Bucephalus. And I don't know if you know the story about Bucephalus, but Bucephalus was a, a war horse, a stallion. And uh, Alexander the Great was a young man, maybe 15, 16. This horse was in an arena and it was going nuts. And Alexander, the story goes, saw that he was scared of his shadow. And he entered the arena and turned the horse away from uh, into the sun and, and calmed the horse. And he conquered the world on that horse. There was a city built called Bucephalus. And um, to me, that, that, you know, as a horseman, that had a romantic... Um, uh, flavor to it. I love the idea of a young man finding a horse and then literally conquering the world on it. And, um, you know, so that I, I had always known about that and had an interest in it. So there was, you know, the link into Xenophon was something that I, I dived into easily as well. Well, I think there's something really powerful about your program. Just if you look through all the philosophers through, through time, almost every major philosopher who talks about just the value of getting out into nature. And I can imagine you take a highly stressed, injured veteran and you take them kind of semi alone into the woods and just get them. Well, I think Thoreau said it best where we get really oppressed by governmental systems or our community, but it's kind of like cigar smoke. So if you go on a long hike and you get out of the city, then it doesn't really matter what your government is because, you know, no one's there to bother you if you're on a peaceful walk. And I think modern life has forced us to live in a way that we're really not designed to live. I read recently that anxiety when you're alone is natural because, you know, the human condition, a bit like the horse, if you separated from the herd, you know, historically we could be doomed, as we say in Scotland. Um, so, you know, you're supposed to be anxious when you're alone. And uh, the, the, the whole process of nature, you know, so the way that we run the courses is, is, look, the horse is part of nature. And I think that when you become isolated in the modern era, you, you tend to look at flickering screens inside without natural light. And these things are not good for you. I don't, I don't need research to tell me this. You know, I'm not interested in somebody says, oh, look, you just live a little and think about it. If you're staring at a little screen all the time, you know, to me, I always think of these, you know, when you you go, you see babies and they're lying on the cot and they've got one of these colored balls. To me, that's what people look like when they're on a phone. Me, 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 me. You know, <laughs> it just, and, and I can see why, because it's so addictive, but personally, I don't carry one. You know, I use it when I want to and, and, I, could, and I feel much better for it. I used to follow certain people on Twitter. Don't. You know, you can't affect what X, Y, or Z says or does. All it does is upset you. So I just delete it all. And I had to go through that process myself to really understand it. You know, it's a tool. If I've got if I've got a hammer, I don't have to hammer everything I bloody see, do I? <laughs> you know, I hammer that which needs hammered. So with her nature to me, part of the whole thing was getting people outdoor, getting some fresh air, just the very basics. But we always said that sitting around the fire after the debrief, after doing something, was actually the most powerful part of the course in the sense that, you know, you've got a team of people who can open up and talk to each other. They're outside. That fire, there's something very basic within our psyches about fire. We're drawn to it. And, um, you know, so the programs also include things like photography in the sense that we want people to go out and look at nature. 
you know, and, and because it will feed you, it will give you an energy. And to me, you know, our happiness is dependent on us and what we do. We spend our whole lives blaming other people, um, you know, governments or councils or loved ones or whatever. But the truth is, we're, you know, if our philosophy is true, which I definitely believe it to be, we control what we do. That's the beauty of the gods. They gave us free will. Well, you've got to use them. And part of it is to spend as much time in nature as possible. It will feed you. So it's interesting. So you worked with pretty significantly injured uh, veterans. Did you have to have someone like build you special tackle, or were you fairly was it fairly easy to modify the equipment you had? Yeah, we could. You know, we had to build saddles. With one of my um, heroes is a guy called Baz Barrett, and uh, he knelt over an IED that blew his right leg off with the hip. Uh, an amazing guy. Uh, and he now runs a company that helps other companies with safety. Um, but we had to build a saddle for him that had a side on it that went up under his shoulder because he had nothing on the right-hand side. But look, we're Marines, mate. We don't do camp. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> there was no, there was never any, no one's ever come here and we went, oh, I'm sorry, we can't do that. No, you know, it's either we all do it or none of us do it. And we're all going to do it. So, you know, I, I do think that can-do attitude was extremely useful. As, as you know, if we can't, uh, as a Hannibal that said, you know, if, if we can't go through them, we'll go around them. Well, that's kind of the attitude that we had. You know, we were going to do it. It needed doing. So and we weren't going to have Baz sitting at the bottom of the hill watching the rest of us hooting and hollering. So you adapt, you practice, you train, and you get it on. So, yeah, I, you know, it was a very powerful experience for me and, and emotional, you know, for all of us because for... Baz, um, I remember quite clearly being on a horse coming around the corner. His two daughters, eight and six, um, were standing there and he was riding a the horse. They looked apart and they looked up at him and said, well, Dad, and he said, yeah, I'll teach you something about the horse because he hadn't seen it. And uh, later he, he, he said to me, do you know that's the first time that since I've been hurt that my girls looked up to me? So, you know, there were little things that happened that were like big punches and uh, they motivated all of us to keep going because... You know, these folk, I, I, I believe if you serve the country, we should serve you. With all the success that you've had with your program, do you have plans for the future in terms of are you trying to grow your project or is it, is it sustainable? Well, yeah, we do. I mean, we, we want to keep helping the community that we serve, which is the veteran and the, and the serving military. However, uh, over the last year, you may have noticed that there's been a, something of a, yeah. <laughs> a virus floating about. And I, I hope, I'm sure it's the same in your country, but carers and NHS staff are, are really working very hard and they're experiencing some of the same traumas as our service people have experienced. And I think there are lessons that can be transferred from one community to the other. And to that end, we start work. Um, well, we started work this week after a year's negotiation to develop courses for carers and NHS staff based on what we've learned with the military community, but it will still be based on the principles of, you know, community purpose and empower, of looking after each other, of understanding ourselves better, to be perfectly frank, and, and being a little kinder to ourselves. You know, one of the things I see happening in the modern era very much is that we're frightened of everything. You know, if your dog dies, you're supposed to get upset. You know, that's the truth. <laughs> so, very true. Know, the human, the human, uh, emotional range is quite broad and it's supposed to be. And I think we've got quite frightened of feeling anything. Uh, so, you know, the, the, to me, it, it's about dispelling fear. And, uh, you know, this relates again back to the Stoics because, you know, if you understand yourself, you will be able to manage life better. So, you know, we demonstrate human behavior through the horses. And I get a horse that's not being desensitized and introduced it to a plastic sheet and the horse will freak. And I mean, it freaks. The plastic sheet can't hurt the horse. You know, I've got a second horse who I've desensitized and that's what the way we do that is we introduce him, you know, a horse that trusts me, you build a relationship and I can introduce it, the, the plastic sheet to his muzzle. He then begins to understand what it is. You've got to take the time and you can't teach the horse faster than it can learn. So, you know, it's up to the horse what pace you do this at. But the point being is that once the horse looks at it and understands that it's a plastic sheet, he's no longer frightened of it. 
And for me, this is an analogy for human behavior, because if we run away from that which frightens us or try to drown it or smoke it out or whatever we do, it, the fear is going to grow. It's only by looking at what frightens us in the eye and understanding it that we can, you know, it will stop frightening us. And to me, this is one, you know, this is memento mori. This is the, the, the crux of it is, that, you know, and and I can, there's a resistance, I think, to, you know, taking on this concept because for a lot of people, death is frightening. And, uh, you know, sort of understandably. But if you think about it rationally, you can't do anything about it. So the secret to me, what, it, what memento mori means is that, yeah, I'm aware I'm going to die, which means I'm going to enjoy today. And that's all there is to it. And, you know, you it's about helping people kind of get their minds looking at the world in a slightly different way so that they can handle these fears like the horse. And that's why the, the, the horse behavior is so powerful in getting across ideas, because I think that if you're going to try to get a concept across, if you can illustrate it visually, you know, sort of almost out of context, it helps people see what you're trying to get across in a way they, they probably wouldn't have thought possible. So, you know, it really is about trying to help people embrace these stoic ideas so that they can be happier. It's that simple. On a personal level, did you have any experience out there working with veterans or any of the people that you've walked through your program that kind of really had a more meaningful impact or kind of, kind of was an epiphany moment on your own, your own thought process? Yeah, I think that one of the moments that will always stay with me is that I, when we started this, I, we hosted the guy, he was a sniper. And our newspapers put on the front of the page, you know, saying that this guy's killed more people than anybody else, which, you know, not really helpful. The guy was already hurt, and he's, he's a hugely successful man. I'm not going to mention names, but, you know, the guy. Anyway, he came, he was a big guy, and he could not interact with us at all. He couldn't make eye contact, he couldn't speak, and he carried this big day side with him everywhere he went. Anyway, we got through a bit of the week, and, and he had ridden horses. He'd been in a cavalry regiment. And at the end of the week, I kept him on and we went up the hill together on two horses because most people come here don't ride. So it was a joy for me to go and because this guy was a lot better. Anyway, we got up the hill and we stopped, we got off and he started to build a little fire. And I was going, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a fire. And I said, why? He said, well, I want to show you. And he got the day sack and he pulled out a rope that had been carrying around. And he said, I've been carrying this rope around for six months because I've just been looking for the right tree. And he burnt the rope in front of me and said, I won't be needing it anymore. Now, <coughs> if something like that happens to you, because I really admired this guy, it, it does affect you, there's no question. And, you know, that happened early doors, and it was one of the spurs, if you excuse the pun, to, to, to doing what we do now. Because I could see that everybody in life needs help sometimes. And, you know, we, at the end of commando training, there's something called the 30 mile. And this is after six weeks of getting the help. You know, I mean, it's tough. So you've got to do 30 miles, you're carrying a pack, you're carrying a weapon, you're carrying, and there's eight of you. And I always thought it was a final endurance test. But when I became DS, when I became a trainer rather than a trainee, I understood what it was really about. And what it was about is teaching that in life you will fall down. There's no ifs, buts, or maybes. No one gets through here without getting a kick in. The secret to life is to have people around you that pick up your weapon and your gear and get you through the, clip, the, the, the mile that you can do because 10 miles down the line, you'll be doing it for them. That is life. And to me, that, 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 that final exercise in the Marines taught me that, you know, if you are, if you're lucky enough, you need community because you will fall down. And if you can be honest with your pals and say, look, guys, I can't do today, then you're going to live in a much better place than pretending that you're all right all the time. Even in itself, the, the Stoics use something they call hard winter training, and I think modern Stoics tend to refer to it as Stoic toughening training. But that idea that you go out there and you test yourself until you fail, because it's that failure point that you learn so much more. And I think that in kind of modern society that we, unless you're talking military applications, we really typically aren't put in those situations where we're going to have to do that or have to rely on other people or have to come to terms to say, you know, I'm going to go out and take on this challenge knowing that somewhere along the way, way something will go terribly wrong and I'm going to have to overcome that. You must be frightened of it. You know, the, the thing is, if you look at it, 
and accept that things will go wrong, which they will, then it's all right. You know, this is what I mean. It, it's almost like it goes back to this tarpaulin on the horse. It's not looking at the things that frighten you or cause you the problem. So I hope that, you know, you can see how my experiences with the horses, I, I should have said that, you know, when we came here, we, we started working with horses a little differently. I got a, a mentor myself from California. His name is Robert Gonzalez, and he's a third generation Cherokee horse trainer. The guy is a genius. I mean, he can do things with horses I can't believe. And, um, you know, I think this is the other thing in life is if you're on a journey and you keep adding to the what you know, there's a huge pleasure in it. And it's not about getting to the top of the hill or anything. It's just about, you know, it's like wiping on, on a paint window. And every day you can just see a little more. And there's there's a real pleasure in that. And, you know, that to me is the, the art of happiness is know yourself, try to stay in the minute <laughs> and look after your friends. So how big is your operation now? Like how, what's the size of your farm? How many horses are you using? Uh, the farm is about 50 acres. We've got 33 horses. Which take a bit of looking after. But, you know, if you'd asked me as a five-year-old kid what, what would be paradise, I'd say, you know, looking after 33 horses. So I'm not complaining. Um, uh, you know, we're obviously having to do stuff online at the moment. We we were hosting courses right up to Christmas. And we were also, we, we'd started to host military families that had been affected negatively because of post-traumatic stress within some of them. And, you know, it's it's really about serving that military community and trying to find ways of empowering them post career so that they can stay together and and use the skills they've developed both within their military careers but also through recovery to positively affect the rest of us and you know the present situation we find ourselves in many of our frontline staff within the nhs and carers are really struggling and they're going to need some help and i hope we'll create a bridge from one community to the other so that we a empower our people but b have a very positive effect on on the folks who need it now. Once you figure out kind of that way of dealing with, well, maybe the military is kind of the ideal test bed or model. Like if you can deal with the military trauma, you can pretty much kind of copy and paste that technique onto the rest of society. So it makes lots of sense where you can kind of, yeah, connect people to understand better the military mentors and have military. Well, you know, the military, look, the positivity that the military attitude has taught me. You know, the can do. I'm not saying we transfer everything from that world to the NHS, but, you know, the fundamentals of teamwork, the fundamentals of leadership, the fundamentals of honesty, trust, respect. You know, these things are true in any community. And I think that in the military, we have got particularly good ways of articulating those things because of the experiences that we've shared together. You know, if you talk to somebody who's been in uh, combat or on, on ops, the, the intensity of it creates bonds that are not like, you, you know, it take a lot longer to create these types of bonds because you've got shared experience. And to me, you can use that in the same way. So you're a medical person, you're, you're dealing with somebody that's dying. There's a team of you around, you're all working. It's the same thing. It's human endeavor, collectively achieving an aim. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we can learn from each other. I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to say everything in the military culture is transferable or right but a huge amount of it is and especially in the situation we find ourselves now which is adversity you know the, the liberal kind of way of looking at the world and everybody's got the right to everything they want is great when everything's groovy but the minute the poop hits the fan we need something a little bit more solid to, to get us through it you know that's yeah very true and now i can't remember who it was oh frederick the great said he was always an epicurean when things were going well but when things went well or went terrible he was always a stoic which is kind of an interesting <laughs> phrase but you need stoicism to fall down on yeah and i mean i think that you know i'm going to repeat myself but you've got to accept there will be hardship so it's not a bad philosophy to embrace even if things are going well because you know you'd have to be the world's greatest lunatic optimist to think it's going to go well forever hey is there ways that the audience could either get in touch with you or support what you're trying to do? Yeah, and I mean, I, you know, I'm very interested to speak to anybody on that side of the pod. I've got some people, we've actually hosted um, uh, people over here from the States, uh, SF guys. And, um, you know, so we've got mentors, as it were, over in your side of the war. Uh, there's a guy called John Stance who was just, <laughs> he was 
blown up and he had major head wounds. And it took him a long time to rehab. But he is a phenomenal character and, um, you know, somebody that understands our... So my hope is eventually we could maybe, you know, down the line, uh, look at taking some of the lessons we've learned on this side of the pond and transferring them because it has been extremely successful in the sense of people preventing suicide, re-establishing people, reconnecting people. And it's about common sense. You know, it, it's not about having highfalutin jargonistic bollocks, as we say over here. You know, it's about really trying to connect with the guys and bring them into the fold and make them feel important again and, and give them that purpose. And I feel that, you know, we that there is a need now that wasn't here a year ago where society is really going to have to pull together. Well, is this not a resource that we could use? You know, outdoor learning, um, getting kids that have been cooped up for a long time outdoors, just, you know, helping the environment, but, but learning about teams and leadership and stoicism in the meantime. To me, you know, I'm talking to the Scottish government about this, and I think it's vital that we prepare the next generation for the next plague far better than we've done this time. And, you know, we mustn't run away from that which frightens us. We've got to look at it. And, you know, we're going to face other challenges, so let's prepare for them. So as far as time, how how much time do you typically have for your 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 program itself? So you you know you're talking about building relationships and you know what have you found effective in terms of how much exposure you need that kind of help reset? When we started, we started with week long courses. So individuals who'd served the military would come from all over the UK, which for you guys on site is like coming up all over Maine, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> um, but the point being is that it, what we learned very quickly is that there was obviously, if you're suffering from anxiety, the leaving the house is difficult. You know, so we had to think about how we got people here more effectively. And we worked with a charity called Fears for Free, a brilliant guy called Dave, who, Dave Gibson, who goes and collects the guys now and brings them up. Uh, the second thing was that a week wasn't long enough. What we did with a week was we opened the door and said, look, here's hope. And then after you know five days, we went, right, cheerio, go home. So what we do now is we, we run three weeks spread over six, nine months, Th three weeks where the guys go come here, they get the first week and then they go home and we've got exercises for them to like going into nature, like trying to change the diet, like trying to just little things that they can do as individuals. But importantly, they come together every week online and, you know, that there's a sense of team. They now have somebody they can talk to because the isolation prior to coming here was a real killer. Week two continue the journey start to focus on you know the individual what they can do and what they'd like to do because you don't have ambition if you're in despair you can only get the ambition once you're stable so you need to get people to that point so once they start saying right i want to do this that and then we can use the military family to try to get the individual to into a position where they're they're contributing to the world and participating again rather than watching daytime TV. And the third is is the icing on the cake as you were, you know, by now they're a team, they're talking to each other, they re-establish themselves. So that last week is 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 more like a, a an R and R trip, an AT trip, because by then they've they've kind of worked it out. The thing about what we've learned here is I can't fix you. You can fix you. Now you need might need some inspiration and to talk to people. But, you know, it's a journey you're going to have to take. And, you know, I think that what you can do as an individual trying to help, I can do as an individual trying to help you is to a, introduce you to people that are that where, where you are now so that you can have some hope, get you to talk and open up about how you feel to people from the same world. Very important. It's no good having somebody wearing a white coat, a clipboard that's never been anywhere near the military starting to talk to the boys at ain't. Um, and also, and then try to try to you know help change your ind individual behaviours little bit by little because you know if you're isolated and, and you you're in despair you don't eat you don't sleep you drink too much you smoke too you know we can it's about giving people the belief that they can change these things so they're now part of our community and then you know we'll ask them to become mentors or ambassadors if they don't find employment but the ideal is they find some place for themselves where they have the community purpose and empowerment. Uh, and they're back to somewhere they feel in control again. So, you know, it doesn't matter if it's the kids is the same, you know, we're good trying to get the, the belief in themselves back to a point where they can engage, because it's always a lack of confidence that stops people doing things. And, um, you know, as I say, we, we now have this NHS, but behind it all is this idea of EDIP. So we teach by an explanation, a demonstration, and then an imitation in practice. 
So, you know, we're going to talk about stress. We talk about how neural pathway generation works in the human brain, how the human brain is so malleable. We are what we think we are. We are what we tell ourselves to be. And, you know, we have control over how we see ourselves if we're well. Uh, and then, you know, I use the horses to, to, to um, something visual to illustrate that point. And then we've got the, the team talks where, you know, we can start to talk about individuals changing something or other and being honest with themselves. OK, I drink too much or I do this too much or I, you know, I watch too much telly or on screen time because it's just getting these little behaviours in the prevention phase can make a huge difference. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, it's not as if we're going to be bored moving forward. And I hope that, you know, as I say, the lessons that we've learned will help others because, you know, we're charity. I'm not doing it because I want to go, I want to get rich. As I explained to you, I ran a, a company and ended up with a fancy car and a fancy watch. It may be... Oh, <laughs> Talk about barking up the wrong tree. The, 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 I've got to tell you the truth. I was sitting in this fancy car, right? I was driving about and I thought, you know, this is the first day going, hey, ain't that cool? And then I thought, what do you, how do you react if you see some, some idiot sitting in a fancy car looking out the window? You go, what a beep, beep. Well, that's how the world looks at you, you idiot. <laughs> so <laughs> why, why are you feeling good? <laughs> You're making me feel better about driving a 20 year old vehicle. <laughs> I, I love people that battered, battered up old Jeep or something. You know, it shows me that your your values are in the right place. Trinkets don't make us a man. And uh, you know, I, I, again, the Stoics understood this. You know, and, and I think that again, you know, we, we are we do live in a society that really bangs the, you know, you're successful if you've got money or celebrity. Well, the Stoics made it perfectly clear that celebrity should be hanging off trees and, and not admired in any way at all. The shallowness of that that kind of admiration is ridiculous. You know, we should admire people that have done something, that do something, that have achieved something. But look, I, I, I got to go. Is there anything else? Because I really enjoyed it, and I hope that you've got some. You know, I hope I I don't kind of sit around and prepare. You know, I, well, not in the sense I'm going to write stuff down, but you know, I, this is what I think about all the time, and um, I've enjoyed. I've really enjoyed yakking with you. Yeah. A exceptional conversation and you know those unprepared conversations tend to be better anyway so i appreciate uh your time and i look forward to well i wish you all the success with your program and i i look forward to you being able to, to continue to say how successful your program is really good fun thank you